Greetings, I'm Charles the Historian. As you can see behind me, I'm outside Raymond James Stadium, right there. Home of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Super Bowl 55, which you can see right there. Super Bowl Tampa Bay, and there's the Bucks. Um, as we get closer to the big game, I'm telling the story of how our sport began. So, in the first video, we talked about kind of the invention of rugby, because rugby comes from soccer, which they called football. And from rugby is when we're really gonna get our sport. And the last video, we talked about the first game, which took place at a uh, school called Rutgers, which I'm sure that many of you have heard of, uh, in 1869. Now that was more like soccer. It wasn't so much football, but it was more like soccer. And um, you know, it had some kind of football or rugby with it. So now we're gonna kind of see it transfer from that to rugby with some kind of soccer, which is more or less what we have today. Um, although there's not much soccer, but just, you know, it kicks. Uh, it kicks off. So uh, I'm gonna explore how we went from the violent version of soccer uh, to gain like the basic form that we have today. So after Rutgers played Princeton, they invited other schools to play the game and it spread around the Northeast. Some schools were not as enamored with soccer, like rules, and changed them to their liking. And Harvard was one of these teams. Now there were lots of games between 1869 and 1874, and I'd love it to cover them all because I love it when historians are thorough, but honestly, that's not good for a YouTube channel to cover every single game that was played. So we're just gonna focus on this one game uh, that happened in 1874 between Harvard and a school from Canada called McGill. And then we're gonna take a look at how Yale and specifically a man named Walter Camp transformed and developed this game into something closer to what we'll see in that stadium than the one that was played in, in Rutgers in 1869. So if you remember in the last video, and if you haven't seen it, please check it out here. I'm gonna put the links in the description. Um, the Rutgers game did not allow for carrying the ball. It was soccer, but with like hard hits and you could bat the ball along with your hands and a guy got a concussion um, and you know knocked into a wall it destroyed the whole thing um, and as that version was exported to other colleges the guys over at Harvard began to play with what they called the Boston rules and or the Boston game I guess they, they, they called it at the time which this allowed for carrying which was sim similar to rugby each school had their own variation of rules and most of the time these students were playing each other for fun at school and you know they wanted rules that kind of dictated the personality of the people that were playing, right? So you could imagine, you know, a, a smaller group of people favoring rules that let you run more, and then a group of people that were larger, maybe you hit more, or you know, doing different things, right? And you scrum and you tackle. Um, but before we get into this narrative, I should make a note that football, or the kind of team deathmatch version that had been played long before this era, which is like called mob ball. Um, it was already kind of around, but it wasn't really, there wasn't much goal to it. It was kind of like how we had played the game called Kill the Carrier or something. In fact, Harvard used to have something called Bloody Monday, where freshmen and sophomores would play a very disorganized and violent game of mass football. I'm not too sure of the rules. I'm not even sure they, th they knew what the rules were. Uh, but it got so bad that police were routinely called and the game was outlawed for a long time. And the students hated this so much that they had a mock a funeral for a guy uh, for a character called Football Fightum. There's weird kids, but after many years of lobbying and playing unsanctioned and underground type games um, in the Sandlot sort of type thing, they were allowed to play again. Only this time things would be a bit more organized, uh, at least compared to like the mayhem of previous decades. After a few years of constantly having to adapt to each other's rules every time the school would go and they'd have to play against the other team's rules, um, many of these colleges decided to establish like a unified set of rules. So representatives from Yale and Columbia and Princeton and Rutgers, they had a meeting at this Fifth Avenue hotel in New York. Um, con conspicuously absent is Harvard, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but at this meeting, they decided on rules that would make the game more like what Rutgers was playing, more of a soccer game with aspects of rugby than rugby with aspects of soccer. Of course, this affected Harvard because by not belonging to this league, it was difficult for them to schedule games, especially when they were playing an almost entirely different game. Um, you know, it's not like, it's like they're running and they're carrying the ball. Um, so they had to look elsewhere uh, to get some people to play them. And of course, that, at this time, that meant across the border in Canada. So they called up, well, they didn't call up, they, they wrote up the school named McGill, which if you've never heard of it, 
Um, I don't blame you because we're in the U.S., but it's like the Harvard of Canada. They've had like 12 Nobel laureates and like billionaire alumni. They've had prime ministers. So, you know, they were, they were like the Harvard of, of Canada, at least from what I can gather. And, you know, respect to them for coming down here and playing, uh, you know, Harvard. Uh, they came down to Cambridge in a game playing that they're not even totally familiar with. So they decided to play two games, and it went back-to-back dates. They decided to play on the 14th and 15th of May in 1874. And the first game would be played by Harvard's Boston rules, like the Boston game. These rules are kind of funny if you consider today's sports, but uh, one of the rules I find interesting is that like, if you're carrying the ball, it's allowed, but only if the person is being pursued. So if you're running away with the ball, um, you can run with it. But once the guy stops chasing you, they can yell out, hey, like I've stopped chasing you, and the guy carrying the ball has to put the ball down and basically play soccer. That's kind of crazy. Can you imagine like the NFL of somebody like breaking down the sideline and they yell out, we've stopped running, and all of a sudden like Mike Evans, who's in this picture here, has to suddenly start kicking the ball into the end zone. Like that's their rules. It was crazy, like for us. And the second game would be played by McGill's rules, and they were a lot more like rugby um, and our modern game. So they allowed the player to pick up the ball whenever he wanted, and equally important uh, was that they counted tries, which is what we would call touchdowns. Um, and the field, it wasn't the same as the football field we have. It was wider. It didn't have an end zone. It just where the you know end of the field was would be the end zone. Um, but the idea was that if a player got to the goal line and touched the ball to the ground, um, that's important to know, it'd be worth points. So you can get the ball across the line. Nowadays, it just has to break the plane. But back then, you had to touch the ball down because there was times when players would break across and then they would be physically picked up and thrown back out before they could touch the ball to the ground. Kind of in a way, it's sort of similar to spiking, except for in spiking, you're not touching the ball to the ground, you're throwing it on the ground. So no, no Gronk spikes. Um, that'd be a fumble. So, uh, but then it only counted after a free kick was made. So if you touched it, but you missed the kick, you didn't get any points. So as you can see, the origins of what make our game different than other countries is already kind of there. Uh, meanwhile, it should be noted heavily that this all had formed from the football that we call soccer and that everyone else in the world calls football. I brought up the fact that they got the name soccer from Association Football, A-S-S-O-C, and then they added the E-R, um, you know, a soccer, and then, you know, just soccer. And I want to emphasize that again here. Americans are just constantly called dumb because, hey, it's not football, you don't use your feet. Um, but, you know, that's because people don't know their history. Because you're dumb! So I'm teaching you right now the history, right? So our sport developed from football to differentiate it from association football. They took the British name of soccer. So we were playing what they considered football, just by different rules. And the sport that is now called football, like in FIFA, um, they said, well, that's association football. And so the British call it soccer is a, like a nickname. We'll call it soccer. So that's how that happened. So Harvard won the first game 3-0, or, or it just stopped after 22 minutes. I'm not really quite sure that what it says. Um, and they used a heavy round ball, but not like a rugby-style ball. Uh, this made it a bit harder to carry and not favorable to kick because it was oblong. Um, but the next day, they played by McGill's rules, and apparently it was a tough match because nobody scored. So uh, McGill got on a train and went back to Canada, unwittingly having sown the seeds of what would become football, the NFL. Harvard went to McGill later that year. They played him again using McGill's rules, um, which counted tries, and they won by three. Harvard chose to play Tufts the next year with the adopted rules, and then it began to spread around. People thought this was great. You can carry the ball. It's a lot more fun. And the game against Tufts is one of those trivia questions that you should keep in your back pocket next time you're at a bar and they break out trivia. So it's often listed very specifically, like with an asterisk, as the first American football game between two American colleges using modern rules. So the first football game is 1869, Rutgers versus New Jersey College, which is Princeton. Um, but this one's the first one, like, between two American colleges using, like, those rules. So while the Rutgers-Princeton game was considered a primordial first game, the first one that was the embryo of what we see today, Harvard, you know, it was this game, and Harvard's lost to Tufts, but now they were starting to play exciting football and getting large crowds. Remember, the first game only had 100 spectators. You've got no friends! And these games would start getting like a couple thousand people, and eventually they thought, maybe we'd get these people to pay. And people got into crowds, and things got more and more exciting, and the snowball, as you can see, grows, right? 
Um, Harvard really liked this tries stuff. They thought it was great. It made for exciting plays, you know, something to, it's so simple as advancing the ball and touching it to the ground would get you points. It's very primitive, like a caveman trying to get some meat or something that he's stolen uh, back to his campfire after stealing it from another cave. There are people on your side trying to help you get it there, and people on the other side physically trying to bring you down to take your object. So that's like, kind of just speaks to the most bestial thing in humans. So this kind of like bestial game, I think resonates with us for that reason. So, um, you know, uh, you aren't trying to throw something away like in basketball or baseball or hockey where you're trying to knock something away. You're trying to keep it safe until you get it where it belongs. You know, sorry to wax philosophical, but it was the pretentious Harvard spirit, I guess. Um, you know, talking about Harvard makes you want to do that. <laughs> uh, anyway, with this new development, Harvard reached out to its blood rival, Yale, and asked if they would stop being jerks with their rules and play them. And Yale, always up for a chance to show Harvard that they were not cowards and that they were their equals, agreed and decided that they would blend the games a bit. Um, Harvard agreed to some of the soccer stuff, and Yale agreed to a lot of the Harvard stuff because it looked like fun, basically. You can carry the ball whenever you want. If you were tackled, the play stopped and the sides reset which allowed for strategy. And these schools, of course, love to try to outthink each other. I mean, let's fast forward to when Yale pulled that great prank on Harvard where they had all the people show the we suck thing. Uh, you suck, you suck, you suck, you suck, you suck. I'm in the crowd, right? So like, you love to like chess match each other. So the stopping uh, allowed for that kind of chess match. So you had the option to run and dive at the goal line and score points in a dramatic fashion, uh, which was awesome. Right. So on November 13th, 1875, Harvard played Yale in the first ever The Game. That doesn't sound right, but that's what the rivalry's called. So the highly and highly, and I mean highly anticipated match, was to be held at Hamilton Park in Connecticut, in, in, uh, well, closer to Yale. Um, they took the field with 15 men on each side in front of 2,000 people who paid 50 cents each to watch. Harvard and Yale showed up in the first ever football uniforms. So. Prior to that, you kind of just wore like whatever you had on, right? Um, you know, I mean, obviously you take off a jacket, but this time they actually like made uniforms for the game. So uh, let's do uni watch for them, right? So um, Yale had uh, dark trouser style pants tied at the ankles, a blue jersey, and a yellow toque, which is a brimless close fitting hat. Um, you'll see them in the old like pictures there, you know, here you go. Harvard wore crimson knee breeches, which is the forerunner of our modern short football pants, um, and uh, a shirt and stockings. Yep. So that's kind of like the first uniforms. And it said they wore crimson. I don't know if the whole outfit was crimson, or if the pants were crimson, or just the shirt was crimson, but it said they wore crimson. So that's, that's where you go. But it didn't even matter because they won 4-0, despite some controversy at the game. So, when Yale did lose that first game at their home, they were hooked on these new rules. They thought it was awesome, it was fun, so they quickly adopted them. But besides being the first game of the week, the first college game day worthy matchup, if you will, in football history, uh, something else important happened in our historical dominoes that we've been trying to put together. Uh, at this game, there was a boy who was about to enroll at Yale, and he was there to root on his uh, school because he was from Connecticut. And, uh, you know, he's probably sad that they lost, but man, did he see an exciting game and he just saw the potential and thought, I'm going to get involved in this. And his name was Walter Camp, the father of football, as they call him. When he joined Yale next year, he was quick to join the football team and started making suggestions. And next time, we're gonna find out what those suggestions are. So as always, thank you for watching. Um, check out the other videos that I have in the series. So I'll put the link down for the ones that are previous to this. And uh, you should check out the other ones on the uh, general history and the other stuff that I do. I've done pirate history and mafia stuff and all kinds of things. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.